Okay, our next talk uh, comes uh, from Susanna Fox. Now, um, one of the prejudices uh, I have is that we get the biomedical innovation that is financially incentivized. Um, and that may not necessarily be the biomedical innovation that is most important, particularly when, when it comes to therapeutics. Uh, very often the intellectual property tail uh, seems to wag the therapeutic dog. And there may be an under-emphasis and uh, uh, under-incentivization of user-led innovation. And, and, and that thought really piqued my interest when it comes to the next talk. Uh, I asked Susanna how she wanted to be described. Uh, and um, uh, she said it very elegantly and also briefly. And she wanted to be described as, as someone who helps people navigate health and technology. So with that, I'll hand over. Thank you. So, uh, oh, thanks. So I have a question. Am I allowed to use the chalkboard? Does anybody know? Um, there's chalk. Because how many people saw Hidden Figures? How many people really wanted to write on a chalkboard <laughs> after seeing Hidden Figures? So um, this is my first time, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I think that these two talks together really embody from the lab to the living room. And you'll see it's for, in my case, it's from the lab to the kitchen counter, because I really do think that a lot of user-driven innovation is going to come from people who are working at home, working at the kitchen counter, coming up with innovations. But um, inspired by hidden figures and inspired by what I've seen so far, um, I'm going to quote my friend Mickey McManus, who um, has this great illustration for where innovation is going to come from in this century. So he talks about how the 19th and 20th century was all about climbing a mountain of knowledge that would essentially look like that. So you become an expert in chemistry, or you become an expert in engineering, or, or you become an expert um, you know, in, in fine arts. Um, and the really interesting work that's going on, which this group obviously is experiencing, um, is at the edges. You know, so, so people who can span the edges of things and, and make translations between things. Um, and so thank you for having me. Um, and um, I really didn't know that you guys were going to be this geeky. So um, I'm actually going to um, add to my slides um, and, and show some illustrations of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to switch gears and talk about the hardware of healthcare. Um, I started, gosh, almost 20 years ago, looking at the social impact of the internet on um, American society and got drawn into health and healthcare um, by following the hackers of healthcare, which is people who are living with rare and life-changing diagnoses. If you follow these people, they're kind of the artists of healthcare. They're gonna push on every tool until it breaks to figure out how it works and how they can leverage that tool to save their lives or the lives of their children. Um, and uh, what I saw in following these folks is that they want to use technology to unlock information and data. And then about six years ago, I saw how they were unlocking it um, for hardware, medical and assistive devices. And my overall message that I really want you guys to take home is that um, often when we are sick, when we get a new diagnosis, or when we face any challenge in our lives, we feel alone. And we shouldn't. Because there are people who want to help us if they knew how to find us. And I think that that is really the power of this era that we're living through, that the internet has given us access not only to information and data, but to each other. Um, so as I said, I, I saw this over and over in my research in doing field work um, and then testing what I saw in my field work in national surveys. Um, and um, so I spent a lot of time as a researcher. And then as my career expanded, I got different opportunities. And I started to see the same pattern in um, business and entrepreneurs and also in the government. Um, what I saw is that people really want to connect. People who feel alone because they have a business challenge, because they have an idea for a product. 
um, they feel alone and they want to cluster together with other people like them. It's why we see startup clusters in places like Silicon Valley. Um, as the Chief Technology Officer at the US Department of Health and Human Services, I ran an innovation lab, which I called a unicorn watering hole. Um, because there are people in government who think like entrepreneurs. They are people who are way down deep in the hierarchy. And by the way, the federal government is as hierarchical as the military. I mean, I really saw it at HHS. And if you're down here and you have an idea, you don't necessarily feel like it's okay for you to have an idea. And so what I could do as the chief technology officer, I worked for the secretary, I could sort of say, by the power vested in me, I make you an entrepreneur for the next three months, and you're allowed to have ideas, and you're allowed to test them. And I was inspired by what I saw, again, in my field work with patients, um, because they have the same fire in the belly that I've seen in entrepreneurs. They really want to solve problems. Um, and uh, I'm gonna tell you about one of the entrepreneur moms who I've met. Erin um, Moore is a mother of four. Uh, her son Drew, pictured here, is six years old, and he lives with cystic fibrosis. So he has to do three times daily treatments. Um, and you know, so, so she does her best in trying to get Drew to do that. And so, you know, in terms of the lab and the clinic, the prescription is given. This child must do three times daily treatments. Well, imagine what that's like when the child is six. And so she lets him have screen time. But what she really needs is a hands-free nebulizer. And so she tweeted a picture of Drew trying to sort of balance the screen with his hand while doing his treatments. And she asked for her community's help in trying to innovate. Um, and what she got back was an incredible array of ideas. Uh, so Jose Gomez Marquez, who runs a lab at MIT um, called Little Devices, he tweeted back some of his ideas. Keith Grimes, who is a clinician in England, tweeted back some of his ideas. And the community kind of poured in to try to help Aaron. And she then took pictures of, of what they were experiment, experimenting with at home. Um, I particularly like the helmet. Um, <laughs> and um, so, so people tweeted, you know, so tell me how big is that nebulizer mouthpiece? And so she tweeted a picture of it next to a quarter. And the other picture is um, Drew's older sister who's getting into the act and, and working at the kitchen counter to try and figure out how to solve this problem. And over the course of a few weeks, they came up with a pretty good solution for Drew. Um, and, and that's really at the very basic level, but at an incredibly critical level of medicine and healthcare delivery, of how are we gonna get this kid to do these treatments? Um, and I think that Aaron's work deserves our recognition, as does um, everybody who helped her, because they are, to me, um, a symbol of what I think we can really build. The title of my talk is, How Can We Build an Innovation Nation? Um, Americans have this can-do spirit, and we can now upgrade our skills um, thanks to the internet, thanks to low-cost manufacturing tools. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that um, and how important it is that we recognize that really the internet is giving us access to each other. I'm gonna use the word maker, um, and I wanna just see a show of hands. How many people know about the maker movement? Awesome, okay, great. Um, so, Makers um, modify and improve the world around them. They look at a problem and say, not only I'm gonna fix that, but they say my community is gonna fix that. It's about a return to craft and making things with your hands, um, but upgraded thanks to things like 3D printing. So imagine if MacGyver had access to a lab or a tech shop. Imagine what will happen when people who are experiencing any kind of a physical challenge have access not only to the prototyping tools that are now becoming ubiquitous, 
but also a whole worldwide community of people who can advise them and help them. I see a parallel between the empowered patient movement, where I spent 15 years doing field work, and the maker movement, because it's all about bringing together expertise, building a knowledge base, and empowering everyone who has access to that knowledge base. And I think what happened with the democratization of information and data is gonna happen in the democratization of access to design and manufacturing tools. And what's really key about open innovation, and this is a theme that we've seen through talks about open data, is that the most brilliant thing that Erin did was she shared her question. She shared her problem and then she shared her prototypes and therefore was able to get feedback to improve them. So we know that our healthcare system is broken. And I think the only way we're really gonna untangle it is if we bring in the ingenuity of everyone in the system, which includes patients and caregivers. Um, I'd also like to point out that this spirit of the maker movement of, of you know, knowing how to fix your own car um, is, is really old, and it's always been part of healthcare. Um, and I couldn't resist putting in a slide. This is my grandfather. He um, actually grew up in Silver Cliff, a, a tiny mining town south of here. Um, and he came east for medical school and became a cancer researcher. And uh, during World War II, his lab faced shortages. And when he couldn't get quartz lenses, he came up with um, the idea of using sausage casings. Um, when he needed uh, radium and couldn't get it, he got surplus blackout reflectors and harvested the radium. Um, and uh, what, what I also really honor is the fact that patients and caregivers have also always been tinkerers. People living with disability are hackers. They have to be. Um, and so what we need to do is hand them the tools and recognize what they're contributing. Um, when I think about how technology is changing the innovation landscape, I often think about a course I took in college um, about the history of the printing press. Um, and you might remember that um, when Gutenberg created the printing press, he recreated the illuminated manuscript. He recreated the Bible. It was heavy and ornate and beautiful and printed in Latin and very likely to only be owned by someone in the elite class. Um, well, within 50 years of um, his invention, the model changed. People started printing pamphlets, which were portable, could be printed in uh, multiple quantities, um, often printed in the lingua franca of wherever it was. So it could be distributed to a wider literate audience. They could be folded, they could be traded, they could be hidden if somebody's coming. Uh, they were documents of controversial times. And here we have, I love that we had to talk about the American Revolution, because here's Thomas Paine's Common Sense pamphlet, um, which is credited with helping to spark the American Revolution. Um, so what I would ask you is, what are the documents of controversial, controversial times now? Is it blogs? Is it Twitter? Where are we seeing the model changing in all kinds of ways, in science and politics and elsewhere? Um, what's really old about what I'm talking about is people's grit and know-how, and what's new is the possibility of updating people's skills and recognizing that what we really need to do is to connect people. Um, and also, for generations, we've celebrated our great inventors, the Gutenbergs of healthcare, who worked alone in a lab in a priestly capacity. And we're now seeing a new kind of innovation landscape which recognizes people who are not in those positions, who might have great ideas but really are working with duct tape um, and zip ties. Um, so I think we should still celebrate the lone genius in the lab, 
Um, but let's also celebrate the mom at the kitchen table. Um, what I'm seeing in the landscape is barriers to entry are being lowered in communications, design capabilities, and manufacturing. Collaboration across time and space is now possible, and crowdfunding is now possible. Um, and so my question is, what will happen when everyone has access to the tools that they need to solve problems, and they have an ability to share those prototypes? I think everyone's a change maker, and it starts with a willingness to ask why. Our challenge is that a lot of people, particularly people in power, are still stuck in the Gutenberg Bible stage of innovation. They don't yet see what's possible. They don't even realize there's a revolution going on. Um, they think that they can control the conversation. They think that they can control the means of production and that their success depends on that control. I think they're wrong. I hope they're wrong. Much of my career has been spent leading innovation teams in powerful conservative organizations. Um, and much of my career has been spent um, telling people, change is gonna come to your industry. And having people say, no, it's not. It's, you know, publishing is just fine. <laughs> um, healthcare is just fine. We don't need technology, but of course we know that change is coming. Um, people don't believe that something so flimsy as a pamphlet could start a revolution. So um, what I want to say is we can't listen to people in power who don't believe that people should have access to their own data, that people should have access to the means of production, um, and that people should have access to the data that science produces. Um, I want all of us to recognize that we live in an, a time of abundant opportunity to connect with people who share our values um, and share the values of open data. And um, the movement towards participatory design in healthcare, I think, is the inevitable result of connectivity. Um, I want to tell a story about how we created this space for innovation at HHS. Because um, you might be thinking, chief technology officer, does that actually have anything to do with the technology that runs the department? Luckily, no. I had nothing to do with the email or the websites or the interoperability of healthcare. Um, what we did was bring entrepreneurship into the US Department of Health and Human Services, into the CDC, NIH, FDA, et cetera. Um, when we were um, looking at how to bring in new ideas, one way to do that is through prize competitions. In 2014, the FDA sponsored their first prize competition. It was called the Food Safety Challenge, and it was a hardware competition. Um, they face a, an issue where when they're going out in the field trying to detect salmonella in fresh produce, it actually takes five days between the time um, somebody visits a site and they get the sample back to the lab and, it's, and, and they get the result. Five days is way too long. We've seen foodborne um, outbreaks and, and we want to cut that from five days to five hours. And so they put a challenge out um, to anyone who wanted to enter. And um, the five finalists were given $20,000 to develop their ideas. And I went to the competition where people were presenting their five ideas. And um, I walked around and talked to each of the five teams. Uh, the first thing that I noticed is that each of the five teams was actually addressing a different problem. And so while only one team was going to win the grand prize purse, the FDA was going to benefit from all five innovations. What a win for the American people for, a, frankly, a pretty low cost. It's about $100,000 that we put out there to allow these people to innovate. The second thing is I asked each of the teams, what was the best thing about participating in this prize competition? And all of them said the, the $300,000 grand prize purse would be great, but we've already gotten so much out of this prize competition because we were given an FDA mentor. 
somebody who could give us advice about what we were developing. Um, for example, one team said that they learned from their FDA mentor um, that the, the device they were creating had to be smaller because it had to fit in the back seat of her car. Um, another team said that their device they learned had to be more durable because it was going to get knocked around going from site to site. In the regulatory environment that we currently live in, these innovators and inventors are not allowed to talk to anyone at the FDA. Let me repeat that. The designers are not allowed to talk to the customers. So I rushed over to my FDA colleagues and said, what was the best thing about participating in the prize competition? And they said, oh, it was incredible to be able to actually talk to people who are creating the products for us. <laughs> and I thought, you know, this is what I'm here for. This is what the chief technology officer is supposed to be doing. What, what the role is, is to create space where these conversations can happen, to create a pop-up community of practice. And I sort of think of it like I was holding an umbrella. And it was OK for people to gather on the, under the umbrella and talk for just that one year during the prize competition. They otherwise are not allowed to. And that's parallel to the pop-up community of practice that Erin created when she tweeted that picture of Drew and asked for help. And um, what I want to say, again, is we're living through this era. I don't know how long it's going to last when technology is a Trojan horse for change. We say technology, and you know, since I've built websites and I know about technology, I get to come in and wave my hands and appear magical and, and do things that otherwise are not allowed, like allow designers to talk to people at the FDA. And um, so we talk about technology, but we mean innovation. We talk about interoperability and open data. But we all know that what we're really talking about is culture change. Um, what I'd really like to see is that this collision between health and technology look less like a battle. I'd rather not use a battle metaphor of the Trojan horse. I'd rather it look like alchemy. I'd rather it appear more magical um, instead of creating conflict. Um, so that's my wish. Um, in um, Again, when I was doing my field work, I, I spent time in communities of people living with rare disease. One community um, is Mobius syndrome. Um, Mobius syndrome, um, it's, it's pretty rare. I think it's about two in a million um, babies in the United States. Or it's very small. And, and it presents with full facial paralysis. And so you're immediately presented with an issue um, of how to feed a baby who can't actually close their mouth and suck. Um, so spending time with these folks, I, I was talking with them about access to information and social networks and, and data as I, as I generally was interested in. And they would answer my questions and then say, but look at what I made. I made this assistive device for my child. Um, and so then I started asking other people living with rare diseases um, and other people living with disability, what have you made? which is sort of the, the classic question of the maker movement. What, what have you made this week? What are you working on? Um, and so when I came into the government and became the chief technology officer, my office was really focused on open data and open innovation. But I brought in this idea of medical and assistive device and hardware innovation. And I spent about a year doing exploration of the intersection of open innovation and hardware. And I met some incredible people. I went to Pittsburgh um, and met people at the Human Engineering Research Laboratories. That's um, a collaboration between the University of Pittsburgh and the VA. They co-design assistive technology with returning veterans who use this technology. This is a picture of the strong arm, um, which gives uh, more ability to people who are using a wheelchair. Um, one picture that I can't show you is um, a prototype of a wheelchair. They asked a veteran um, who uses a power chair um, what would he like? How would he like to improve the power chair? And he said, well, what I'd really like to do is take my kids to the pool or to a splash park. Um, because right now, if I take my kids and water gets splashed, then the chair shorts out and it ruins the day. Um, and, and so the engineers set to work and created a wheelchair that runs on compressed air. It's a hydraulic system. And so now they have this prototype, and, and they're thinking about developing it. 
Um, but it's one of those things that no manufacturer thought of that. That's something that a veteran thought of and suggested. Um, so something that I'm really interested also is the um, clinical application of this work. Um, and so I visited the first makerspace in a hospital. It's down um, in Galveston, University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, and this is Jason Schaefer. He is a burn unit nurse, um, and he was inspired by the experience of caring for someone with chemical burns over most of their body. Um, the oil industry is, is down there, um, so they deal with that a lot. Um, so Jason and two other nurses had to spend hours irrigating the skin with handheld nozzles, and it was exhausting and inefficient. So he created a prototype in the makerspace of a portable shower unit with three adjustable heads. Um, and he 3D printed some of the parts and, and created it. And it's a, a very simple, elegant solution to a real problem in the burn unit. Um, and, uh, and we wouldn't have known about that if there hadn't been an engineer on hand and make the makerspace for Jason to try that. So what I think is that we, um, we need to honor these folks. Um, we need to recognize what Eric von Hippel of MIT um, calls lead users, people who have the problem and are therefore uniquely suited to solve it. Think about how many people adapt medical and assistive devices and then don't share that because there's no platform. There's no intake valve for how people are improving and innovating at home or in the clinic. Um, think about how many people think that if they adapt something, um, they're doing something illegal, and so they don't share it. Think about how technology has really become so locked down um, so that we can't open it up and look at it like we used to be able to do. How can we shift that? How can we make it so that people are able to open technology up and change it? Um, so what I would say is that smart organizations are looking for those lead users, looking for new product ideas. Um, and um, if any of you have seen some interesting work in the hardware of healthcare, I'd love to hear about it. The group that I'm watching is a group um, called the We Are Not Waiting movement in um, diabetes. These are people who are able to hack their um, diabetes devices to create a continuous loop. It's essentially an artificial pancreas. Um, and a lot of people hear that and say, oh, the FDA is going to come down on them. Nope. The FDA actually said, go for it. That's fine. We don't mind at all. And it's the device manufacturers who are locking down access to the data and locking patients out of innovation, of their own problem solving. Um, I'm also really interested in the assistive device space for people um, living with age-related disability. This is clearly a growing need, um, and I think that designers should really be focusing on it worldwide. Um, the barriers that I saw in the empowered patient and data liberation movement, however, um, I, I see the same barriers in terms of manufacturing and hardware. Um, the old hierarchical model is one in which device manufacturers ignore the lead users. And what I love is von Hippel characterizes this attitude as, we innovate, you consume. And it doesn't honor people's experience at all. What I'd like to see is a shift to the user innovation model, which rewards manufacturers who see these lead users as partners. Um, the currents that I see running in our favor are as follows. Industrial strength manufacturing tools are becoming ever more available. They're becoming cheaper, easier to use. Access to new manufacturing capabilities, such as rapid prototyping tools um, using 3D printers, those are creating new opportunities for individuals and small businesses. There are new funding mechanisms um, and opportunities, crowdfunding incubators and accelerators. Social media enables people to crowdsource their ideas and share prototypes. And this return to craft and making as a more mainstream activity 
Um, I loved visiting Pittsburgh and Galveston. Um, I'm really fascinated by um, this new industrial revolution that is happening in places like Detroit, where we have a history of being able to fix things. How might we harness that for healthcare? Um, so my question to you is how can any of us boost or mute any of these forces? Um, and, and here, this is where I'm gonna get a little bit more geeky and, and do an illustration that I hadn't planned. Um, when I got to the government, I had trouble explaining to my colleagues in the leadership and all across the federal government what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> because I came from this world where I had spent a lot of time with patients and caregivers. And they basically spend, a lot, I spent a lot of time with people who are N of one. And they spend time in a totally different universe. Um, and so I came up with this um, diagram. So for this axis, it's barriers to entry. So, so this is high barriers to entry. Um, so um, these are things, what stands in your way of creating a prototype? You can't prototype your idea, you can't get funding, you, um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, a class three device, so the FDA is not even gonna let you test it, versus things that are low um, barriers to entry, like this is pretty much something you could make at your kitchen counter. Um, Non-invasive, not a big deal, pretty cheap to create. And then this access is what is the potential application, what's the potential audience for this? And it's um, N of one at this end and um, the world at this end. Um, and so I realized that I had spent most of my career down here um, with N of, N of one, low barriers to entry. And so I call these people the MacGyver patients. Um, you know, people who, um, and do people know, um, people know the show MacGyver? Okay. <laughs> Because um, sometimes when I talk to younger audience, they're like, what are you talking about? Um, so I spend a lot of time with MacGyver patients. Um, my colleagues in the federal government only think about the super, super high-end labs and worldwide application. You know, that's, that's government work. Over here is kind of university labs. I would put the VA in this, you know, where there's, where there's less, you know, I would put like um, lower limb prosthetics. Um, whereas um, upper limb prosthetics are, 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 are lower down. It, you know, you sort of 3D print a, a, a hand if you need one. Um, and then uh, low cost, low barrier with infinite um, possibility. I think of things like um, the baby sling, the first time somebody used a piece of cloth to be able to hold their baby. Um, and in consumer goods, there's actually models for this. Nordstrom, um, which you know you probably would characterize over here, actually uses make, created a partnership with Etsy because they realized that they didn't have a bead on what was coming up in craft and what was coming up in being cool, and so Etsy is the cool hunter for Nordstrom. And so what I would say is these MacGyver patients, how might we take the ideas that are in this quadrant and move them over? How might we lower the barriers to entry so that people can um, move up into into that quadrant? Um, and so, so that's really what, um, I, and the greatest compliment was when somebody said to me, um, I've only ever thought about this quadrant. I didn't even know that these existed um, in healthcare. Um, and so I'll conclude by saying, um, let's make things. Let's continue to innovate. Let's build an innovation nation that gives the power, gives information, data, and tools to people who need them. Um, and I'll close by saying that, you know, so how can we do that? When people in power don't wanna give up the means of production, how do we do that? Well, in the Obama administration, we changed the rules so that you could do open innovation, so you could do prize competitions. Um, so that the NIH is now requiring that data um, be published um, in an open data format. Um, at the clinical level, open notes has really changed the conversation about patient access. Um, you know, Casey Green has talked about, you know, how might we create awards to show that people, it's great to be a research parasite. Um, so I would love to hear your ideas um, for how we can just keep shining a light on this possible future of innovation, whether it's in hardware or other ways.
Uh, Susanna, thank you very much again. Um, we have got time for some questions. As part of my <coughs> teaching, I advise a lot of undergraduate students, and many of them are very motivated to get involved in public health and improving health and all of that. But they, for most of them, the path is very narrow. They think the only way to do it is to go to medical school, and many of them end up becoming unhappy doctors. Um, so what advice would you give people like me who have to advise undergraduates to find these opportunities to channel, you know, they're very tech savvy, they're very, you know, they have extremely good motivations, they do want to do things that improve the world, they have all the right intentions and talents. How would you advise them to find these opportunities? So one of the things that I really don't like about um, technology is that people think that it is just about making an app. Um, and that's why I'm really passionate to get people interested in the maker movement and to, and to marry this idea of, of data and technology into hardware. Um, I think it's also really important for people to solve their own problems and to stay close to whatever, whatever is their passion, what they see in their lives that needs to be solved. And if they don't have a motivation, then just go up a couple generations. You know, visit your grandparents and look at what they need. Um, or, or connect with communities um, who are innovating in this space. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunity to connect uh, uh, if they can um, be inspired by something that they see online and follow their curiosity and, and, and talk to them about how, like, yeah, it's important to, to, to go deep into a field, but stay open to the possibility that your best contribution might be in an adjacent field. I saw that hand first. It may not have been up first, but it was the one I saw first. Short question. When I was recovering from shoulder surgery some years ago, my wife designed um, basically shirts that you know were buttoned in a different way so I could do it with one hand. Uh, she mentioned the idea to my surgeon who didn't know where to go with it, but if she had a way of connecting up with garment manufacturers or somebody else, if there's some kind of clearinghouse that might have facilitated going from the lower left to the lower right quadrant. Exactly, and I think we, we need that kind of platform because there's, there's so much good stuff that's dying on the vine. And I really think about how in healthcare we're leaving half the team on the bench by not recognizing people who aren't on the organizational chart, which describes every patient and caregiver. Um, so we, we need that platform. Uh, we, we've got a couple down here. Rich, Richard next, I think. Thanks, great, great talk. I'd like to just touch on the question of regulation, and you were probably struck as I was with the wouldn't it be nice if we could talk um, story. <clears throat> we're moving into this um, era where people are talking about deregulation, removing regulation. What I think you're talking about is changing the nature of the relationship between the regulator is indeed the customer in a very large sense, but the mental paradigm that we've all worked with for, for a couple of generations is they are there to stop bad things happening. That's their principal role. So what we're doing in Europe on the medicine side is actually getting the regulators in at the beginning and having cross-stakeholder, customer, patient, doctor, innovator, and regulator getting together and saying, okay, this is a good idea. What do we have to prove and how do we prove it together? But that's a change of mindset really for everybody, particularly the politicians, who will think until they're told otherwise that regulation is simply there to, to cover their ass. Good point. And, and what, what I would add to that is that um, my colleagues at the FDA, one of the great things, and by the way, I highly recommend doing a tour of duty in the federal government or in the state government because you can't really understand how things work until you do a tour of duty. And, and once you're in, they tell you honestly, we would love it if people understood that we're not here to stand in the way of innovation. You know, as long as it's not inserted into your skin or you swallow it, you pretty much can innovate. Um, and, and so th that's what the FDA really wants people to know, but they're really super highly regulated. And so they, they're so afraid of getting called in front of Congress. 
Um, and, and so they don't step out of line. A question over here, I think. Um, thank you, Susan. Um, thank you, Phil. Um, I just wanted to speak to the program real quick as far as the collaborative chronic care network. Um, it just, um, I know we're kind of out of time, so I'm going to try to make it real quick. Um, I got a good report. There was almost two inches thick from the Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine. It was, I guess, part of the NIH, and, and there was talking about how, I mean, it was very long and laborious, but it was talking about how useful milk thistle was for people that had chronic liver conditions. and. When I went through my treatment back in 2002 for Hep C, my, my gastroenterologist said there was nothing to it, and but it was already pre-existent and people that are pretty sick and I mean it was really useful to be just to be using that very basic kind of bio biochemistry type of, of tack, and uh, I just wanted to you know also mention that uh, you know um, alpha lipoic acid also helped and cinnamon and so on and so forth, so it just seems that. There's already stuff out there that could be a great assistance, and since it was in the news recently, you know, Vietnam veterans have the highest instance of Hep C, and it's going to cost 500 trillion, 500 billion to, to treat them. That just some really simple things that we could augment for this, you know, chronic condition, because even after they're, you know, cured of their Hep C, they're going to have lingering liver liver issues, and of course that cross correlates just for so many things with biochemistry and. I never really thought much of it, but the more I learn about it, the more I study about it, the more I write about it, the more relevant it seems for all, all of our conditions. But of course, you know, with Phil's great lecture, I'm, I'm completely dependent on development of, you know, recombinant DNA technology and molecular genetics and stem cell research and all that as well. So, but the integrative approach, I think, is just as relevant today as it, as it ever was. So thanks again. Thank you. Right. Um, Larry sings your... So, Sitting right in front of me. Well, I, 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 mean, I like that seat. Um, so, so I loved listening to you. And if I had been giving your lecture, I would have done almost exactly the opposite on every point. I want to ask you, this is a question. I like your lecture better than the one I would have given by orders of magnitude. But I still want to ask. So if you, you know, so... And I, and I think there's an integrated part that could be more about my brain, and I think I'm going to go see a therapist. So, so when you started talking about the communication, the book I read that was the most important book about all this communication was the book Bowling Alone, which I know you know, because you know everything. And it was about a, essentially an argument that there is no communication. There's a bunch of chatter. 59 character chatter. None of us think we're learning anything from the president's t twits or what tweets or whatever they're called. <laughs> I, I mean, so 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 communication is, has to be about something, and so I worried about that when you focused on that, and then I wrote down, oh God, what did Erin do that was so good? She asked a question, mm -hmm. zero smugness. She said, help me. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of people crowdsourced in the way that uh, Matthew Todd talks about all the time. And, and so absent smugness, you can ask for help and you can get it. But if you're not careful and you, you think you're a smart ass, you're not going to get a lot of help. So I'm worried about that part of your talk. I would have said that many of the opposite things. I'm almost done. This, this is a question. I want you to tell me I'm wrong about everything. Um, and then... Maybe the most important thing is that although it's wonderful to do on your drawing things kind of in the lower left where there's low barriers to entry and small numbers, you know, sitting here with us today is, is my friend Neil Siegel uh, somewhere back here, wonderful friend who is all about scale. And so scale isn't necessarily about driving profits up to the upper right-hand corner. It's about maximizing value everywhere. I mean, nobody would rather have, I think we would all like to have, I think, widespread products that are broadly used appropriately, monopolies, if you will, a word that we're not allowed to say, at extraordinarily fair pricing, where, and, and of course, Everybody who wants to go up there is talking about making more and more money, not fair pricing, but more and more money. So somehow I ended up thinking that 
what, what you were talking about would happen beautifully in a small Native American village in the, in, you know, in, in, you know, I don't know, 300 years ago, amongst the survivors of smallpox, who would have f figured out how to do something. So would you just tell me why I'm all entirely wrong? That's so my question. I'll start with Bowling Alone, which is an important book. Um, but, but I'll gently say that he misses the point of the internet, Robert Putnam. That that um, and that you know that's okay. He's not part of it, and so he doesn't understand it. Um, and but you can't if you don't see it, then you can't describe it. Um, and there there's no more um, human connected group of people than people who are trying to solve a problem together, whether that's online or offline, and it can happen um, across the world. Um, and so, so that's what I would say about the, the argument against the, the sort of anomie of, uh, that Robert Putnam describes. I, I don't see that being the case in, the, in this current age. Um, on um, uh, innovation for, um, you know, this upper right quadrant isn't actually about cost or, or profit. It's just about the barriers to entry. Um, and what you need even to introduce a product and introduce um, something to the world. Um, and um, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that there is some stuff that's always going to remain at the lower left. So the solution for people who have a baby born with Mobius syndrome, there's a corollary with cleft palate. You know, so, so the Mobius syndrome community learned from the cleft palate community for how do you feed a baby who can't suck. That's always going to be a small n. Um, but the, the, um, what the innovations that they've come up with, because Mobius also presents with low dexterity, um, that's going to be amazing. All of the innovations that they've come up with, low dexterity that's age-related um, for arthritis, what might we learn from these communities that have come up with hacks for their kids? How might we translate that to a broader community? Um, and you know, with a little bit more funding, they could make it even better. Uh, I think I'm afraid we should probably break now. I know there's one or two hands. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, uh, looking at the time, let's break now and I think try and reconvene unless anyone's got any objections at 10 past four for the last two sessions of the day. Thank you very much.